Well, anyways, you might say, what on earth is going on? This is a, a day and a season where we are seeking God and saying, God, what do you want us to do on any given Sunday? And so as we are finishing our series on being church, not being the church, but being church, we want to have a conversation. So Pastor Dan and I, we have spoken on various aspects, and we thought, you know, sometimes it's just really healthy to just speak out of our heart, and it's a conversation. And so it's a different delivery system. Our hope is that we can engage you in this greater conversation, not just today, but we want to have a conversation around a few words about being church. But we declare to you that we are committed to doing what God wants. And if we always do what we always did, guess what? You always get what you always got. And so we are open, as you saw this morning, and I have this keen sense we ain't seen nothing yet. So. Well, if it isn't painfully obvious so far, Tom and I are very passionate about the church, which means we're very passionate about each one of you. Uh, last week we shared about being the church as a force, and we declared that the church is people. It's not about the building, it's not about the institution, it's not about the organization. Church is people, to each and every one of you. Uh, so this morning, as we get into a conversation about a variety of different topics, uh, we're going to root everything we do in the scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Paul writes to the church, uh, starting in verse 12, and then the verse 27 is on the screen is the key verse. He says, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all parts, uh, all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Then down 27, it says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And that picture is so beautiful, the fact that we are the body of Christ. We are the church, and the second part is possibly the most important, that each one of you are a part of it. Each one of you have a vital role to play within that body that we call the church. So I think, again, uh, we, the Holy Spirit is such a wonderful part of, of our expressions, and so this morning... You saw how God used various members of the congregation, various members of the church. And when I say members, I'm not talking in terms of, you know, card-carrying, certificate-owning people. But the reality is, is that it's interesting. The whole idea of membership really comes from the scriptures. It says we are a member of the body. So you're not a member of an institution, but you are part of a dynamic living thing. So as we begin to talk, we, we have four words that we, we're going to put up, and this will be what will inform our conversation, calling, gifting, releasing, and meaning. So I want to just start with this whole idea about calling. Um, again, it's very easy for people to look at people like Pastor Dan and I. You know, I remember when God called me to vocational ministry. You've heard that story, and if you haven't, I'll tell you in the break. But what happens is, is that we want to acknowledge the fact that every single person in this room has a calling. And a calling basically means that somebody wanted you to be in relationship and wanted to see you be everything you were created to be. So again, when Pastor Dan talked last week about the church as a force, one of the things that's difference between the field and the force is in the field that everything has to be done by the professionals, quote, unquote. But the reality is, is that, that you don't see anything about professionals in the scriptures. You see things about people who are called by God. So, Dan, what are your thoughts about calling? For me, the word calling is very inspiring. It's very empowering. Uh, the idea, and I spoke on it last week, that we are on God's team, that he looks at you as individuals and says, I want you in my game. I'm calling you. I'm drafting you. It's not just about you, you haphazardly fell into this place called church, and he might find a role for you, that he has called you to a specific place, a specific purpose. And I think that with so many words, we have a tendency to overuse certain words. I've heard people say, I'm called to my job. I'm called to my family. I'm called to this. I'm called to this. I'm called to this. And the context of what we're talking about this morning, we're talking very specifically about the fact that we believe in church, you are called, first of all, I believe that people are called to a local church. That might be a hot take for some people, but people are called to a local church. I believe God has placed each one of you in this place for a reason, for this time. And beyond that, you are called to a role, to a ministry, to some sort of place where God wants to use your passions and your gifts and your abilities. Really quick, when I started here, I won't say how long ago, a while ago, when I started here, I started as the youth pastor. And I knew that God called me into ministry, big picture word ministry, uh, but for a season, he very clearly said, I want you to work with young people. And, and Tom knows as well, there is a whole uh, row of years there 
where opportunities would come along, and I felt they were outside of the youth ministry arena or the youth ministry lane. And I said, that's a great opportunity, but I'm going to say no to that right now because I know where God has called me. He's called me to run in this lane right now. I think calling is a lot to, know, to do with your role and knowing what lane God has called you to run in. And so often, I'll get to this in a little bit, we, we look at lanes next to us and go, that looks appealing, that looks appealing. But we miss the fact that God's called us to run this race in this lane because your giftings and your passion and what he's laid in your heart is for that time in that lane. And if you stay in that, what God can do with you is incredible. So I think, again, as we're talking, and, and just so you'll know, we are declaring today that we are open to saying, God, what do you want to do? I came to the conclusion a long time ago, God was not interested in my opinions. <laughs> I, I, and, you know, you might find that hard to believe. Well, sometimes I do. But we're saying, okay, God, we're, we are going to say, all right, God, we are, we are saying, our, we want you to show and lead and guide us. So can I just say that when Jesus was looking for disciples, we see that he, there was a sense of calling. He called them, in, and the calling was really very simple. He didn't call them to, to do X, Y, or Z. He called them, and he said, I'm calling you, come and follow me. And they left everything, and they followed Jesus. And so I, I wanted to come back to this fact that every single person has a calling and a gifting from God. And I'll just bring this up. I, once upon a time when I was a young guy, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Harold Jeffries, and he talked about volunteers. And as we said, this isn't about volunteers. This is about us being church. But he said that people who have a sense of calling will do things that you can't pay them enough to do. An example of that is the Doctors Without Borders. These are people, many of them, who make a bazillion dollars. They're, they have all of the latest technology, and they volunteer their holiday time to go to places like Haiti and some of the developing places in the world. And they work in very primitive circumstances and situations, technically, but they do it. Why? Because they have a sense of calling. And so again, some of you, uh, as I'm, we're going to be, you know, handing out little little tokens. Is oh, you didn't have to do that. It's a small acknowledgement where we say God is wanting to do something through you. So the next call, uh, the next word is the word gifting. So uh, Dan, what are your thoughts about gifting? I think everybody has a gifting. First yeah. of all, in case you're going here, go. What does that word mean? I think all of you have a gifting, 100. percent I think there's two really important key terms that come along with gifting. One is self-awareness. Often in church, the default way to like discover your gifting is a spiritual gift test. Anybody who's kind of grown up in our youth group or youth ministry or young adult ministry, you've probably been given one at one time. The problem with the gift test is you have to answer honestly. And not everybody <laughs> wants to answer honestly when it's about themselves, right? So it's a measure of self-awareness, knowing what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you like, what you don't like. Um, but along with that is this need to risk. This need to be uh, willing to be pushed into things that are uncomfortable. Because um, I think often God places giftings in your life that aren't quite where you're at yet, but he wants you to step out into them so you can step into where he wants you to be. Uh, so once again, when it comes to like my history of my calling, I was called to be a youth pastor at a time in my life where I would say my level of confidence was not as well developed as it is now. My willingness to speak in front of people was not as developed as it was now. My ability to interact relationally was not as developed as it is now. So I get this calling, and I go, God, what are you doing? Like, that is not something that I'm going to be able to step into. Like, that is not where I'm gifted. Uh, and I had to really surrender to what I believe the calling was in my life and then surround myself with people who could help develop those gifts so I can make it to where I was now. So for you today, you might be going, God, I believe you're calling me into this, and you're asking me to step out in this gifting, but that's really nerve-wracking for me. So my encouragement would be lay down whatever's stopping you. Maybe it's a sense of pride. Maybe it's a sense of fear, whatever it is, and surround yourself with people who can help to build that in you. So three years, five years, a week, whatever it is from now, because God's time is on our timeline, you can step into that gifting because you've done the work to let go of whatever's holding you back and surround yourself with voices that can speak into you, encourage you, and empower you in the gifting that God has for you. So uh, we're still on gifting, and this is also kind of bleeding over into releasing. So one of the things that I'm so grateful is we have created a culture here in Sunshine Hills that allows people to grow and to develop. And um, I don't know, uh, I'm forever grateful for a group of people in Sydney, British Columbia, 1979, some 22-year-old kid, which was me. Uh, Lottie and I weren't married yet, and I showed up, and um, uh, here I was. I was leading them. 
And uh, they loved me and gave me opportunity. And then same thing, came here as a 25-year-old to be the lead pastor here at Sunshine Hills. And uh, you've heard the story. There was 21 of us that first Sunday. And there was a group of people who just gave me the opportunity to grow and develop. And let me tell you, we, you know, I've laid some clunkers. Trust me. I've done some things. Like, oh, man, I can't believe that. But we want to create an environment of love, acceptance, and forgiveness that allows people to make mistakes. And I want you to just know that in that development stage, there are going to be people who are going to make mistakes. But that's part of how you learn. And so just so you will know that uh, I work under this premise, you praise in public and you correct in private. And uh, we had this one, uh, one of our, our, our youth pastors who developed into our assisting pastor. His name was Roland. And uh, he was used to be where Pastor Dan is, and I was in the middle office where it used to be the photocopier. And the joke was that there was a path worn between his office and my office uh, where he'd make a mistake and mess up, and he'd come down, oh, I can't believe I did this. And sometimes I'd walk down there and say, I can't believe you did that. But we didn't, we didn't poll him. You give him an opportunity to grow and develop. And I think the other thing on this, and it was about discovering gifts, I would like you to tell the story about Mexico. But one of the things that I've observed is that, that, that there are things around a, a family in a church, because a church is a family, that just need to be done. And so people may not be uniquely gifted for that particular thing, but they have a gift of service. And whatever needs to be done gets done. So um, we've seen pictures in the developing world, and it breaks my heart, where people are born without legs. And they're on carts, and they use their hands to, for locomotion. Now, they can do that. It gets them from point, point A to point B, but it's certainly a, a far cry from being able to walk. And what happens is, is that when you use your hands to walk on, it destroys the natural de development and structure and dexterity of those hands. And I think that happens in church sometimes. Where, where there are people, because something needs to be done, they're doing something that they're not designed to do, but if they didn't do it, it wouldn't be done. So can I, point, can I paint you a picture of what it would be like if every single one of us really using Dan's Lane ran in the lane or we were really functioning at our highest and best? Now, some, sometimes you may not even know what it is, and that's what we're here for, coming back to. We do have gift texts. They do have gift tests. They do have a value. But at the end of the day, the very best way to discover who you are and what God has asked you to do is be in relationship. I think one of the key things that we are responsible for as a church is the gift of affirmation. Then a lot of times we discover our gifts when somebody can look into our lives and say, this is what you're gifted at, and affirm that in our life. So Tom asked me to tell the story. I'm going to pick on Tyler. I'm sorry. You're like second row, and you're right there. But you know we're going to tell this story because we tell it every time. We talk about gifting and releasing. So we, have a, we had a history. Was it 11, 12 years where we took teams uh, to Mexico on missions outreaches? And one thing that was very unique about our mission outreaches is we never limited it to a certain age group. We said, like, from youth up to adults, we're going to take whoever goes, wants to go, or feel called to go, because there's something about intergenerational discipleship, intergenerational outreach, where you can build in people in a way you can't when you take, like, 50 teenagers and two leaders. It's just, it's just difficult. That's more about corralling all the people together than it is about discipleship. So we took a group to um, Durango, I think it was, this one year, and we were in need for someone to work with the kids. And we looked at Tyler, and we said, hey, Tyler, we need, we need help with the kids. He's like, nope, I'm not good with kids. Like, not my calling, not my gifting, not what I'm good at whatsoever. And we said, well... It's missions field, and that means you have to be flexible, and you have to be put in uncomfortable situations. So here you go. Missions work. Go for it. And what we saw that trip was someone come alive in their gifting and in their calling. That, and he realized it soon, too. He's like, suddenly, what I thought or told myself I'm not good at, God just released something in his life. And he was in there playing with kids and relating to kids, though you know very little Spanish, and they knew very little English. There is an instant connection. There is a bond. And you were so good in that moment in Mexico with kids. And comes back here to town. And he's like, I think I'm going to serve in kids' ministries. And we're like, yeah, you're going to serve in kids' ministries. But it's that affirmation of we, we pushed a little bit. And then we affirmed, yeah, what you see is beginning to develop and grow in you. We affirm that, that you have a gifting in this area. That you are good with kids. That God has called you to work in this area. And now we stand here or we sit here today. And Tyler's one of our most faithful volunteers back in our kids' area. You work at Hilltop with kids, 
And something that happened years ago in Mexico that was affirmed in you has now become one of the major lanes that you run in today. Uh, and that's, that's a, as a simple uh, story how this works. Surround yourself with the right people. Allow them to speak into your life. Allow their affirmation to take root. And suddenly you don't know where God's going to take you in the next few years, right? And I think that affirmation thing, and now we're kind of making a transition to releasing. But again, that that there's a scripture in the book of Proverbs. It says, a man, i.e. woman, man or woman, gifts make room for them and bring them before great men. And so there's two ways of looking at that scripture. One is, is that you're bribing people to get ahead. I think that's really negative. I think it's that, that as you are faithful to your calling and you begin to walk in your gifting, then there, there has to be that place of being able to be discipled and encouraged. And again, if you notice when Jesus was helping people to discover who they were and what they were called to do, you know, Peter uh, be, became Jesus' choice to be, hey, Peter, you're going to be the leader of this group. But there were times where Jesus really had to say, Peter, you just don't get it. And that's all part of this going back and forth. So in this releasing thing and this gift discovery thing, it not it has to be a whole team effort. So what happens is, is that we as a, as a leadership team can say, we are committed to giving people opportunity, but if you don't give people that room to make mistakes and to learn to grow in their giftings, then we're snookered. And by the same token, that it's, so it's, it's the leadership, but it's we have that commitment. So one of the things, if you're fairly new to us, that through the, the years that we've been here, this church has been characterized as a church that has raised up leaders and has released them literally all over the globe. And so uh, you, you know, Todd and I, we've had this conversation. One of the things he said that we, we, we punch beyond our weight class, that I think that when it comes to, it's not about how big we are, it's are we doing what God has called us. And one of the things that we have done is we have raised up leaders and we've released them. We've helped plant churches. We've released people from here who've gone to pastor churches, or we, we've developed worship leaders, and, uh, and then you know they go somewhere else, and sometimes that's hard. But the reality is that it says that it takes five undeveloped people to, re, to be able to step in to cover what one developed leader can do. So maybe you say, I can't do everything that this person did, but there's part of that that I can pick up. We want to excite you about the fact that church is not a spectator sport. Church is not an event, though there's a dimension to that. You know, Dan and I have talked about that. What I mean is we don't say, hey, I'm going to, to church like I'm going to a movie to be entertained. If there's any one thing that just really concerns me is when we come to church to be entertained. We come to church to be church. And I think part, and this is part of the releasing, we, we want to do that, but we can't drag you. And, and the idea here is that one of the great lies is I'm tired, I'm spent, and that's we're going to come to meeting. But I want you to know something, that God is asking you, he's calling you on, on, to be on his team to discover where you fit. And we've talked about one of the things we've toyed with is, is having like a night or a week during the church where the leaders come up. And if you're saying, hey, I don't know where I fit, but I really want to do something just to come and talk to us. We are committed to not just doing the same old, same old. So gifting, you've got one. Don't keep it on the shelf. Unwrap it. How about releasing, Dan? Uh, one thing I'd love to talk about with releasing is um, the idea that I think often in church we tend to play it safe. We just do. I talked about this last week. Sometimes you don't want to release because like, what, what's going to happen if I release someone and they mess up or they do it better than me? I said that last week. But I think um, playing it safe never really get, does what God needs us to do in the kingdom of God. Uh, and often we try not to ruffle feathers. We don't want, we want to be kind when we love and towards one another. Oftentimes, um, you know, there's the appearance that we don't want to receive criticism or feedback. A long time ago, I was introduced to the term holy discontent. And I've held on to that because it's incredibly powerful. The idea of holy discontent, it's the idea that God has laid a burden on your heart for something to get done. And so often in church, I think we silence complaints or we silence criticism. And we miss the fact that God is laying burdens on people's heart, not for us to do the work and fix the problem, but for you to do the work and fix the problem. Uh, that a holy discontent is where God is laying something on your heart where he's saying, you, you're upset about that. You see that concern because you, I've, I've put you in the place to do something about that right now. And part of releasing is us 
recognizing when someone has a holy discontent and going, yeah, you're right, we need to do something about that, so what are you going to do about it? Because God's laid that burden on your heart, and we want to come alongside you and release you in that and help you with that, but God's placed that on your heart, not on our heart. And part of you growing into the person God's called you to be is to step into that and to make that holy discontent some sort of holy forward movement for God and for his kingdom. So that comes back to, again, a calling on a local church. So the reality is that's one of the reasons why we have this vision statement. Our vision is to be a dynamic local church that provides healing wholeness for our local community through the transforming power of Jesus Christ. So when we think in terms of, well, is that going to fulfill that? And I didn't get the okay to, to say this, but we have one of the people that's close to me, and she has a burn for hospitality. That when we come to church about, you know, and, and again, and, uh, you know, we, we've talked about that. We want to get people. It isn't like we just come and, oh, I'm so tired, whatever. But what happens is, is, in, is there's this whole idea about discipleship. I don't do everything right. Trust me. I don't do everything well, and it's not about me. But I am trying to model something, and there are some of you, I, would, I think you have a gift of hospitality. No one has to quote and say, you are deputized, praying, you are now an official you know, person to welcome. But what I do is if you've noticed, I'm at the door, I'm out in the lobby, and I, it, it doesn't come naturally to me, but I try to touch as many of you as I possibly can. I, I shake your hand, I put my hand gently on your shoulder in appropriate ways. But I can, I'm only one person. I am only one person. But I want you to know that, that you know, this holy discontent. And I'm talking with somebody else about, about some of the things that we don't talk a lot about from the pulpit. But we're saying, hey, we are open to saying, God, you show us how we be the church that you have called us to be. Because we can try to do this in our own strength. But we can say, God, you release us. But again, the releasing has to happen both ways. It has to be the leadership saying we are willing to release. And guess what? We are saying we are willing. Now, sometimes we're a little slow. You, if, if you think that we're not going quickly enough or we forget, you say, hey, you remember that time when the two of you guys were up there at the front and you were saying that you're going to do this? Here I am. Let's talk about it. But I also think, too, that there's this thing about self-assessment and, and about this development. Part of releasing is you release people a little at a time. That, you know, that you, you, don't, you, know, you don't put your 12-year-old in, in charge of your house budget. But you can say, oh, well, maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe, sorry, I'm, I, I thought about saying, I'm not going to say that. But the point is, for a week. Yeah, but the point is, is that there's part of this is part of that development. And, and again, there's that discipleship and part of that, one of the models of discipleship and releasing that I really like, and I sometimes forget this, but Jim Hayford said this. He said, this is his model for releasing. I do, you watch. And unfortunately, so often, that's where the church gets stuck. We do, you watch. Second one is, I do, you help. Hey, come, help me with this. And one of the things, too, if you'll notice that I appreciate we have people who are stepping out and you're allowing that. But you've noticed that there is that that, hey, it, with your permission or there's those looks. And it's all about having everything done in order and in honor, preferring one another. And again, as we begin to see people stepping out as they're gifted, what happens is, is we just begin to recognize that that's going to be OK and that that opens the door. So I do, you watch, I do, you help. It goes from this, you do, I help. And the final stage of that is, you do, I watch. But then it's not finished, it goes through. So calling, gifting, releasing, and then we're back to the final word, which is meaning. So talk to us. Well, when it comes to meaning, there's two great lies that come along with this. The first is for those of us who are, you know, the leaders in the church, is the lie that we can only get people to serve if we cast this vision of we need you so desperately and everything's going to fall apart without you. And, I mean, there are times where things are falling apart, but unfortunately when we cast that way, it becomes very needy. Needy is creepy. And we don't want to recruit out of guilt or like, hey, you know, you better serve or like... It's not going to work. Around. Like Recruiting out of guilt never works. So there's a lie that we fall into, the trap that we fall into, where we, we recruit and we get people to serve based out of that sales pitch. It's a bad sales pitch. 
And along with that is the lie that the enemy brings into the heads of those who are volunteering and serving, going, yeah, you're, you're too busy, you're too drained, you don't have time, it's not been worth your time or effort. And I think we fall into the trap of hearing the lie from the enemy on this side that we have to guilt people into serving or else we're going to lose them. And the volunteers or those who serve fall into the trap of, of, of hearing the lie from the enemy saying, if you serve, you're going to be drained, you're going to be exhausted, you're just going to end in, in failure or misery. And that's why meaning is such an important word because our heart and our solid belief is that every single one of you has a calling and a gifting. And when you are put into the right place, meaning and purpose just explodes in your life. Yeah. And there's nothing like that. And for those who have found that fit, you know what I'm talking about. When you, just, you have this sense, profound sense of meaning, profound sense that you are doing what God has called you to do, what you were born to do. And when you are in that place, there's so much energy and passion and joy that comes with that, that instantly, like, we don't want to recruit out of base of need no. or guilt. We want to recruit because we know God has a place of ministry and meaning for you. We want to find that place so you can be all that God has called you to be. And for you, when you find that place, that lie of the enemy is shattered because you're not tired and you're not exhausted. And it's not one more thing on the calendar. It's a vital part of your life because you stepped into the place that God has for you. And there's so much meaning and purpose and value when you find that particular fit. So can you just, if you've fallen asleep, and I'm sure you haven't because we have been just so scintillating in this conversation, but this whole idea is that, that every single one of you is created with a God-given desire to make a difference. And, and, and unfortunately, and so I hope you're, dis, you're seeing in this, already this 2020, you're seeing us, we're taking risks. We're, we're saying we want to do things differently. But we want every single person who serves here doing not out of obligation. Obligation kills. Not out of guilt. Guilt drains. But what happens is when we begin to function and we become alive, and so we say, I can hardly wait to get to that place of ministry, because then in saying, hey, you were late this morning, you're here early, not because somebody's saying, hey, we need you here five minutes ago, but you just can't wait to be where God wants you to be. So I, I got two real quick stories. One is, is um, when, when our family, when we, when we do Disney, we are serious Disney people. And we don't wait to the last minute, or we can't get it when, you know, if it opens at 8, we're there at 7.30. You know, we're there waiting in the line. and for the, We can hardly wait. Why? Because we anticipate this is fun. This is, this, th there's just meaningful being with the family. And what would happen? This is, I'm painting a picture. That's what we want. We want you guys chomping at the bit. When they says, hey, church is coming. We can hardly wait. We're here for the rope drop. When they open the doors, people run in. And the other, the other thing, and that actually happened in a church in Southern California. Church on the way. I'm telling you that during a period of time, they had a small building and they had people waiting in line and they would come and they would wait. Sometimes they would wait two services. They would wait an hour and a half because they would get there and the doors were closed because it was full and the people would stand there. And there was a woman that one of my friends was down there at a, at a, a restaurant looking and she said, I don't know what's going on over there, but people stand in line and wait to get into that place. She says, one day I'm going to go there. My last one is... This is pretty earthy, but my wife likes to change dirty diapers. Now, when it comes to that time, I said, now I have changed my, my, and I said, how can you possibly enjoy that? She says, I don't enjoy the poop, but it's an opportunity for me to look at my grandchild's face or my, by somebody that I'm serving and I love on them, and I make connection. And so something that is an awful, icky, yucky, stinky, smelly job becomes something, becomes something of meaning. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to how Todd prayed earlier, that our motivation is we love God so much, and we love each other so much. And we sit around the halls all the time. Maybe we haven't said enough from the stage. We don't want to recruit to task, we want to recruit to team. And it's not about being on a particular team, it's about being on God's team. Yeah. That we love our Father so much, and we love the work that He wants to see happen in this building, 
in our community, in the world, that we will do whatever it takes to serve him and to serve others because we connect to that greater meaning, that greater purpose. And it's not about just getting something done. It's about the, the kingdom of God moving forward. It's about loving and serving each other and loving and serving the one who gave up everything for us. Amen. And that, that's the end of the day why we do what we do. Amen. So listen, would you just close your eyes? And if you're new with us, um, you know, we, we've got some more to, to, to do, but we always give opportunity for people to make a personal decision to follow Jesus. So again, nobody's looking around. I have asked our elders to just watch so I don't miss anybody. But maybe you, this is your first time here. Maybe you've been here countless times. Maybe you even know about God, but you've never made a personal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Right where you are, by raising your hand, we'd love a chance to pray with you. Is there anybody like that? Okay. Okay, you can look up then. We already prayed about the fire. Here's how I'd like to finish this off. Is um, As I was praying... I believe that we want to make opportunity. There may be some of you, this isn't your time to give an exhortation, but I really believe, can you put those four words back up there again, Dan? I really believe that in closing, there's maybe some of uh, you here that really has a a burn to pray about one of those four things. Instead of us kind of closing shop or whatever, is I'm going to just open again, we're just family. So if you, if one of those words really burns for you and you just want to pray that over us as a congregation. Now is your time. Come on, I think I, I'm gonna. I think there's some of you here, so I'm gonna just wait. Opportunity to pray. Count me in. You know, when they were talking about gifting, I was sitting next to Sharon, and I know for a fact that she didn't want to make eye contact with me because she is, uh, she's been a worship leader for quite a while. She's been in the Lord for about nine years now. She's been a worship leader for quite a while, but she did not like doing it. The fact of the matter is I actually like singing songs a lot. I've been a worship leader for a little longer than her, but she's the one who actually writes songs on her own. Now she knows that. Anyway, so I want to pray for you guys. Father in heaven, I come to your throne of grace, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Father, bringing forth every single person present here, O Lord, who's got questions in their heart about the giftings that you have given unto them, O Lord. Father, help them to identify, O Master, and help them to be obedient, to hear your voice, and take that step forward to come out of that comfort zone into that field where you want them working, O Lord. Let that heart be changed, O Master. Give them the grace, O Lord. Give them the strength, O Master. We are weak, O Father. Lord, we are weak by ourselves, but we find strength in you, O Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength, O Master. We know that when we come out and enjoy our gifts, O Master, when we experience our gifts, O Lord, when we use them, O Master, we know that you are gleaming with joy, O Master, and we find strength in that, O God. And I speak that strength over each and every person that is present here, thinking about that gifting, O Master, thinking about making that one step in obedience, O Father. I give you all the glory, honor, power, and praise in Jesus' most precious name. I pray. Amen. Anybody else?